issues an invitation to everyone. As you listen to today's podcast, let's think carefully about how you will respond to this invitation. In the Gospels, there are some very beautiful scenes about Jesus. And one of them is when he was being baptized by John the Baptist. And a second would be when he was teaching the Sermon on the Mount to all the people who were gathered there listening to him. And then, of course, Jesus was very, very admired by the children, and you see him in the Gospels loving on them. And then we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And then, of course, when he ascends to the Father, we see him before all of those people. And somebody might say, well, what about the cross? Well, the cross is not a beautiful scene. It's an awesome scene. It is a scene that the world needs to know and to see and to hear about it. But it wouldn't fall in the category of a beautiful scene, a scene that has changed all of our lives. But when I look at all of those scenes, I think about the picture that Solomon painted of Jesus standing at the door and knocking on the door. And if you've ever seen that picture, you'll remember that there's no handle on the door. So you can't get in from outside. You have to open from the inside. And there is a passage of Scripture from which he got that whole idea in Revelation chapter 3. So I want you to turn there in your Bible for a moment. And uh, he is talking to the churches at that particular time. And this is the Laodicean church, which is just full of backsliders and lost people. And uh, I want us just to read a little bit of that. And here's what Jesus said. And you know, there are probably lots of churches today. He could say the very same thing. Listen, the third chapter beginning in verse 15. I know your deeds that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you really are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And then he talks about all the things that they have, and he says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Acknowledge that you are sinful and repent of them. And repentance means you turn away. There are many people who believe, have the idea that if you just confess your sins and confess them, then you're forgiven and that's it. But confession says that I agree with God about what I've done is wrong. Well, I could do that over and over and over. Many people do. But if there's no repentance, there's nothing genuine about confession that is not followed by repentance, which means if I'm heading in this direction and it's the wrong way, if I repent, I turn around and walk the opposite direction. And so he says in this passage here, he says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you'd get on one side or the other. So he's talking about a church. There are probably saved people there, but there were so many that were so backslidden. He has nothing to say good about this church. But God doesn't speak the churches as such. He speaks to individuals. So when we come to this 20th verse, listen to what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, that's a beautiful picture of Jesus, how he relates to us. And if you'll notice, he starts out by saying, Behold, and that word simply really means uh, watch. Uh, give me your attention. Watch. You remember when John the Baptist uh, identified Jesus when, and he came on the scene? He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Look at him. And here is Jesus picturing himself here as standing in front of the door. And what does he say first? He says, Behold. And uh, it's interesting when you think about that. He's not a stranger. He's not somebody who's just peddling something. This is the Son of God. And every single one of us has stood on the other side of that door. Before you and I were saved, we had him shut out. 
And so something happened in your life and mine that got our attention. It was the Lord Jesus Christ getting our attention. And many of us trusted him as our personal savior. Many people, they hear the gospel and they do not. And so I want you to listen very carefully to this passage because this is the way Jesus operates. So he said here, behold, that is, look, this is important. And he says, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door of your heart. He doesn't shove the door down. He doesn't push the door. He says, I stand there. I'm standing there because it's important. This isn't some salesman walking by or some unimportant person, but this is God in the presence of his son who has knocked on the door of every one of our hearts. And many of you who have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, it doesn't mean that he hasn't tried to get your attention, but you just decided to think about other things and you don't want him to get your attention. You don't want to think about it, and so you go on your way, getting busier and busier and busier, and explaining away the feeling that you have, that God is beginning to do something in your life. And so if you think about it, he's standing at the door. He has taken the initiative. Now, think about this for a moment. Every other religion in the world, those people who worship their gods, whatever they may be, they're the ones who are doing this, seeking after their God, seeking after their God, trying to do this and that and the other, and you name it, and they're, they're trying to find God. Christianity is the only religion in the world in which our God seeks us. God is a God of love. And when you and I read and we quote John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, he gave his son. He's seeking us, coming after us, interested in us, loving us, taking the initial step to get you saved. It isn't what we did, it's what he has done. So he says he stands at the door and knocks. And it's interesting the word he uses, knock here, and the tense of the verb is, I'm knocking. He says, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing there knocking, which symbolizes, of course, his readiness and his willingness to enter our heart and bring about a change of life. You see, Jesus is not ignorant of what's going on behind your door. He knows what's happening in our heart. And he also knows how much fear and ignorance and blindness and darkness is in a person's heart. He says, I stand at the door and knock. That means he takes initiative to get your attention to listen to him because he has something to say that'll change your life. And I wonder how often he has knocked on the door of your heart. And you said, well, you know, I don't feel good. I'm going to take an aspirin or something. Or uh, I think I'll just go shopping. Or uh, I'm going to a party. I'm going to have a drink or whatever it might be. To turn a deaf ear to the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and his attempt to get your attention is disastrous. Because one day you'll stand before him and give an account for your life. And you'll not be able to say, well, you know, uh, I guess I was just busy. And Lord, if I'd have just known. When you stand before him, you're not going to say anything. You're simply going to be judged. And he says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Watch this carefully. When you deliberately walk away, when God is trying to knock on the door of your heart, you deliberately walk away. Every step you take walking away is a dangerous step because you can keep on walking away. You can keep on deafening your ear to the truth. But remember this, you don't have to listen if you don't want to. But watch this. You may not want to now. You may not want to hear what he's got to say. I warn you again, you keep rejecting him and one of these days you won't want him. One of these days you won't want him. And so all the testimonies and all the Bible reading, all the sermons in the world, you won't want him. When he says, I stand at the door of your life and I knock, he's knocking at the door of your heart. When God sends you a message, it may be very brief, perfectly timed, because he loves you, because he cares about you. And so he says, I, I stand at the door and knock. Not once, but over and over and over and over again. 
knocking at the door of your heart. So let me ask you this. When you start thinking about spiritual things, what do you do? Do you pursue that? Do you say, well, God, I don't know where you are and what's going on, but if you are up there, as people would say, would, would you show me, would you speak to my heart? One thing for certain, God is willing to speak to your heart, willing to make it crystal clear if you're willing to open the door and give him an opportunity. Behold, I stand at the door and knock and knock and knock and knock. And listen to what he says. He says, and if anyone, if anyone, and Jesus doesn't speak to groups. He speaks to individuals. Now, he could speak to every individual in this fellowship this morning, but he speaks to individuals because every single one of us will hear what God wants us to hear. And we won't all hear the same thing, no matter it's the same words, same voice but a different message, and the message from God is according to the condition of your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, if anyone hears my voice. So if somebody will say, well, I never heard God speak. Well, you probably did and didn't know it. Listen, God wants you to know the truth. He wants you to hear the truth. And so he speaks. And oftentimes he will speak something very simply. When Jesus begins to work in a person's heart, oftentimes it's very gentle. And then it grows and grows and grows. And what does that mean? That means that the love of God is such, he's not going to turn a deaf ear to you. He loves you and wants to save you and has the best for you. And all of these scriptures we've read about how the church was operating and how people were living out their lives, God knows how we're living them out. When he knocks at the door of your heart, watch this carefully. He knows how much longer you have to live. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows the condition of your heart. He knows how mired up you are in sin. He knows all the things that you're depending upon to help you through life apart from Jesus. He knows who your friends are. He knows what you believe. He knows why you believe what you believe. He knows, he knows where you've been in life that would cause you to believe what you believe. He says he stands at the door and knocks. Why? Because he desires to save you from wrecking and ruining your life. And my friend, if you were without Christ, if you knew what was in your future without Jesus Christ, you'd say, I want to be saved today. It's the fact that Satan has blinded your eyes, deafened your ears, and you're walking in darkness because you refuse the light of life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. People love darkness, the Bible says, because their deeds are evil. People who know Jesus love the light of the truth of the gospel. He says, Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. If anyone hear my voice. Then he gives us a beautiful illustration here. When he says, look at this, when he says, if you open the door, I will come into him or to her and will dine with him and he with me. Now, what is that all about? Here's what it's all about. In those days, for example, people had very little to eat for breakfast, just a little bread and, and so forth, and the same for lunch. Their meal was the evening meal. And that's when they got together as a family and they had the largest meal then. And uh, they loved the fellowship at that time and talk about things of the day and so forth. And it was a time of fellowship and a very important time in their life. Here's what Jesus said. You let me into your life, and here's what I'll do. I will come into your life, and uh, we will have fellowship. I'll not just be your Savior, but I'm going to be your friend. I will no longer be a visitor, but I'm coming in to be your friend. Whatever your need is in life, whatever's going on, I will be exactly what you need. He says, I'll come in to you and I will dine with you. That was Jesus' way of saying what they would understand so clearly, and that is he's coming into fellowship with them. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he changes everything from your eternal destiny to your daily walk. If you are wise, you'll think about your future. If you are wise, you'll think about material things and not really what's going to make a difference. 
If you are wise, you'll think about your eternal future. You will open the door of your heart to Jesus Christ and tell him today, Lord, I do believe in you. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, and today I repent of the life that I've been living, and I surrender my life to you. And, Lord, I don't know much at this time, and I know that you'll help me, but I'm turning my life over to you, and I want you to guide me and enable me, Lord, to become the person you created me to be to begin with. I need a transformation in my life. What will he do? He will forgive your sins. He will write your name in the Lamb's book of life. You will be eternally a child of God. He will do all the things that we've mentioned plus many others. Not just guiding you and leading you and providing for you. But listen, giving you a sense of peace in your heart you'll never find any other way. Giving you a sense of joy. Giving you a sense of security. Giving you a sense of happiness, of confidence. Now you have him. Everything you're looking for is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Listen, since he is omnipotent, he has the power to arrange anything and everything in your behalf. But first of all, you've got to hear him knock. You've got to hear him say, if you'll let me in, you've got to let him in. How do you let him in? By simply asking, Lord Jesus, I open the door of my heart. Will you come in change my life? Because I know that you went to the cross and paid my sin debt in full. I yield my life to you and ask you to guide me all the days of my life. What's your other choice? There are only two choices. There are some folks who try to straddle the fence. No. Two choices. And think about this. One of them is walking in darkness and sin and all the things that go with that. And one is following Jesus and all the wonderful things that come with that. What will you do? If you're a wise man or a woman or even a young person, you will ask Jesus Christ into your life right now. You will never be the same again. And that's his invitation to you. As he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in with him, dine with him, fellowship with him. How long? Till he takes you home in eternity. And that's my prayer for you. And Father, how grateful we are that you take the initiative. You came seeking us. We didn't come seeking you. And I pray that your spirit will let this message sink deep into the heart of every person who is here, who listens, who is unsaved. And, oh, Father, I pray that they'll hear a loud knock. They will hear a loud voice. And they will have a deep desire in their heart to open the door to you and allow you into their life, bringing your awesome life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. How's it going? Thank you for listening to a knock at the door. Oh, man. If you'd like to know more about Charles Stanley or In Touch Ministries, stop by intouch.org. This podcast is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia.
look at this rockfish. Oh, that's a small one. We will let you go, buddy. Feels good one. Feels like a good one. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Oh, double. Double tiny ones. Wow. No wonder it felt heavy. Catch some more. We need a different door in here. Trying to get sand depth, but it feels it feels like there's some feels much heavier. Tiny. 
I'm not even sure what type of rockfish this is. We will release him and let him go. Uh, 
31 inch. So this is the bait that I've used for my first link cut. It was amazing. It was about 30, 31 inch or so. So I hope we can get a second one. I got so excited that I even forgot to I even forgot to use gap. I get so excited. That was a rock fish at first. We got a baby ling. Ling. That is so nice. Look at this fish. Look at this baby Ling. Let me see how many inches is this guy. Not a baby. 
So this setup helped me catch a lot of fish today. Two link cuts, three rockfish.
got into the trouble of. And welcome to this weekend's In Touch podcast with Charles Stanley. For most people, preparations and gift exchanges will be quickly over, but there's one present that you can enjoy forever. Jesus is your gift from the Father. Of all the gifts that you've ever received, which one stands out above all the rest? Is it something of great value to you today? Has it brought you lots of pleasure? How would you really compare it with all the rest of the gifts? Well, what I've discovered is this. Sometimes the gift that we think is so very important, something comes along and we realize there's something more important, something more valuable. And as you think about all the gifts that you've received, is there anything that you have treasured down through the years? Or have most of those gifts just been something that's come along and you've passed them along and somewhere along the way, you sort of lost your thrill about it all. Well, what I've discovered is this. People who know how to give joyfully and abundantly 
and abundance isn't the same in everybody's mind, but people who learn how to give and know how to give and give joyfully and freely are the happiest people I know. There's something about learning to give because, you see, that's what life's all about. Life's all about giving and receiving and loving, and people who are real, genuine givers know how to love someone. And if you don't know how to love someone, I doubt if you really know how to give them. And so when I think about the greatest giver of all, I think about God, that he is a continuous giver in our life, always giving. Doesn't really ask for a whole lot comparatively, but he's always giving. And the one thing that he's given us above all the rest is what I want to talk about in this message. And I want to title this message simply this, Jesus, a gift from the Father. And I want us to look at the gift. I want us to look at many aspects of the gift because I want you to appreciate having and experiencing and having a relationship with the most important gift that you'll ever receive no matter how long you live. And when I think about that gift, I think about what a tiny gift it was in its original giving. And that is, it came, or he came as a baby, a tiny babe, transported in the womb of the Virgin Mary, born in a very simple kind of place, out in a stable or a barn or a cave, whatever it may have been that they used in those days. And so there did not appear to be anything very significant about this gift. But you see, you have to look beyond what you see with the naked eye and recognize that lying there in a trough, which they fed the animals from, was the Son of God. This was the King of kings and the Lord of lords lying there in the form of a babe. Because you see, the greatest gift that has ever been given was given as a tiny baby. That's one characteristic of this awesome gift that our Heavenly Father has given us. But a second thing I want you to notice about this gift is this gift came from heaven. And in the sixth chapter of John and a number of other passages of Scripture, Jesus made an issue, a major issue out of the fact that he had come from the Father. And if you look, if you will, in this sixth chapter, and notice uh, in the 32nd verse, Jesus said, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. Then he says, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Look, if you on the 38th verse. Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus did not begin his life here on this earth. He didn't begin his life in the womb of the Virgin Mary, but rather he did not begin his life at all because he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He did have no beginning and he has no end. And lying there in that little crib was the Son of God, God himself, a gift from heaven. And you see, to all of those who looked at him, he looked like any other baby, but only Mary and Joseph knew where he really came from, they knew that he came from heaven. And if you'll think about all the gifts that you've ever received in your life, which gift came from heaven? You say, well, it's a heavenly kind of gift, but where did it originate? Who made it? Who manufactured it? What country did it come from? The gift of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only gift you and I have ever received that came straight down from heaven without a maker, without a beginning, without an end a most unusual gift, a tiny gift, but also a very needed gift. Because you see, you have never received a gift so practical, nor have you ever received a gift so needful. Remember this, God gave his son Jesus Christ as a gift to you and to me because he knew we were in desperate need. Sin had wrecked and ruined humanity. Every single one of us has sinned against God. Every single one of us has lived at some point in our life under the condemnation of God, under the wrath of God, under the threat of that wrath. And yet when we trust that Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, when we receive that gift, we didn't just receive a gift. We received a very needed gift. Because you see, the Father sent him 
to meet a specific need in your life and mine. In fact, we've all had many needs. We've had the need of the forgiveness of our sin. We've had the need of being delivered from the sense of guilt. We've had the need of having emotional as well as physical healing. We've had material needs. We've had all kinds of needs. And God the Father sent His only begotten Son into your life and my life to meet very specific needs that we have. And so He didn't just come to be a healer and a teacher. He came to meet a specific need in your life and my life and the life of every single person who's ever lived. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. We were threatened with perishing. And He sent one, the only one who could deal with that. He sent Him because we were and are and the whole world is needy. There's not a single person on the face of this earth who does not need the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now, many people don't know they have that need. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to fill those empty spots in their life. They're trying to fill that big void in their life with something or some person or some experience or some pleasure. There is only one gift, only from one person who can fill the greatest need of your life. And listen, once that need is met, somehow it seems that all these other things we think we need and we really think we desire seemingly just fade into oblivion because there's something very satisfying, very completing, very fulfilling about the Son of God when He comes into our life. So He was a tiny gift, a gift from heaven and a gift that every single one of us need, and He was a sacrificial gift. Listen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And oftentimes we think about Jesus dying on the cross, we don't think about the fact that God the Father sacrificed His only begotten Son, in eternity past, this decision was made. The world would be created. It would be populated with human beings. They would sin. They would rebel against the Father. And so the plan was already set. And the Father chose to sacrifice His Son. And the Son chose to sacrifice His life. And so God gave His Son, His only begotten Son, and the Son gave His life in order that you and I may have the gift of eternal life. And so when you think about the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot even think about that gift apart from thinking about the cross. Because he says, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. This was a gift of sacrifice that was given to be sacrificed in order that every single one of us would have the privilege of having a personal relationship with God. Have you ever accepted that gift? Have you thought about it, planned on it, but you've never accepted the greatest gift that has ever been given by the one person who loves you above every single person on the face of this earth? He relieves the guilt and the penalty and the pain of our sin. He gives us a hope and an assurance and a confidence. He's the greatest gift. And when we sing about all the things about Jesus' life at Christmas time and all the carols, Oftentimes, we still have him in the manger. We still have him as a little child. And we still think about all the presents and all the gifts and things. But the greatest gift ever given was the forgiveness that comes to you and me through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and paid our sin debt in full. He was an awesome, sacrificial gift. He became the Lamb of God in order that you and I may become the child of God, the children of God. A sacrificial gift, a very small gift, a gift that came from heaven, a very needed gift, a sacrificial gift, but also a perfect gift. When you think about all the gifts that have been given you, and how many times have you received things, maybe at Christmas time, and they didn't fit, you had to take them back? Or something that didn't work, and you had to take it back? Here is one gift, once you receive Him, you never have to worry about it because He is the only perfect gift ever received. There's not anything about Him that's imperfect because you see the one who gave Him is perfect. And because you see the truth is who He is is perfect. He is God walking among men in human flesh. There are lots and lots of things about Him we don't know about. 
But one thing about him we know absolutely. His character is perfect. His heart is perfect. His love is perfect. And everything he does is perfect. Everything he's ever done is perfect. Everything he's ever thought is perfect. And you know what? Everything he's ever done for you is perfect. Every gift he's ever given is perfect. Everything he's ever tried to do for you in your life to help you, strengthen you, enable you to become the person he wants you to be and to do the work he's called you to do, every single act by this gift, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been absolutely perfect. You say, well, if it's so perfect, why don't I feel better than I feel? Why can't I accomplish more than I accomplish? Why can't I do what I need to do? When you surrender to his perfect will, you know what will happen? Everything about your life's going to change. You're going to begin to experience perfect love, the perfect expressions of God's love in your heart. And here's what you'll discover. Even the tough times, the difficult times, the trying times in your life, you know what you'll learn? That God is doing what? In His perfection, He's perfecting who you and I are. That is, He's conforming us to the likeness of His Son. So He's a perfect gift, and His goals in your life and my life are to perfect us into the likeness of His Son. But He's also a very precious gift. You think about all the things that you've received, and probably all of us have those things in life that we think, oh, this is the most valuable, no, this is the most valuable, is the most perfect thing I've ever received, the most precious thing that I own. Let me ask you a question. What is the most precious thing that you own? What is the most precious gift you've ever received? And you see, by precious, I mean those things that you highly esteem, that which you place the greatest value on. What is the most valuable gift you've ever received? You say, well, my husband or my wife, well, that's commendable. Or my children. But you know, that's not really true. The most valuable, precious gift you've ever received is Jesus Christ. Because he is the perfect gift from the Father who can do for you what no one else in all the world can possibly do. There is nothing and no one so, so highly esteemed in all the earth. Because you see, the Father esteems him as highest above all. What does he say? He says one of these days, every knee is going to bow. One of these days, he says that every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no more precious gift in all of life. And yet sometimes, people highly value those things in their life that they own. In fact, they value them so highly that they come between them and the precious gift of Jesus. They put more time on those things. They give more thought to those things, those ideas, those things that bring them pleasure or comfort in life. When the most precious, most powerful gift, the gift that is above every other possibility, is the gift of the person of Jesus Christ. Because think about this. Here's one gift with whom you can have an intimate, personal relationship. More intimate more personal than your relationship with your husband and your wife. There is no intimacy in all the earth, no intimacy in the entire world, no intimacy in any generation that can meet, measure, or compare to the intimate relationship you can have with Jesus. That's why he is so precious above every other single gift. Nothing as perfect as he, nothing as precious as he, once you begin to understand who he is, you will agree he's the most perfect and most precious gift of all. And I'd simply ask you this. Since you have received the greatest, most precious, perfect gift of all, to whom have you shared it? To whom have you given it? Have you been enjoying the gift by yourself, to yourself, and sort of thinking, well, I have Jesus in my life, and that's what matters. That's only part of what matters. What fully matters is this. To whom have you given him? To whom have you given him? To whom have you sat down or stood or walked with or lived with? And you've said, I want you to understand who Jesus Christ is. I want you to understand that he can forgive your sin. I want you to understand that he can give you the gift of eternal life. Here is one gift you and I cannot possibly keep to ourselves. Because he said, 
Jesus said, as my Father sent me to give myself away, so send I you to give yourself away. And in giving ourselves to him, he is able to use every single one of us to give ourselves to other people. And I would simply say to you, if you have never personally trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he's God's greatest gift. He is the most esteemed, most precious, perfect gift in all the world. But you have to desire him. You have to want him. If you don't want him, you don't have to take him. What a tragedy to reject the most important, the most awesome gift ever offered to mankind. And the scripture says, he was sent by the Father to do what? Sent by the Father to seek and to save that which is lost. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, let me ask you this. What gift are you going to receive that's going to take his place? There is no substitute for the perfect, priceless Son of the living God. And listen very carefully. Here's the key question. How can I have that kind of gift? Well, you say, well, can I just ask for it? No, that's not quite adequate. Well, I can certainly work for it. No, you can't work for it. Well, why can't I work for it? Well, let me ask you this. How much work would you have to do? Can't answer that. How long would you have to work? Can't answer that. But even more so, listen. You can't receive a gift as a result of work. Because if you receive a gift as a result of work, it's no longer a gift, but it's a reward. And he says, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy, his grace, his love, his goodness, he saves us. So, if it's a gift, can't be a reward for works. If it's works, can't be a gift. The only way for you to receive this gift is to ask him, confessing your sins and your unworthiness to him, telling him that you do believe that his death at the cross paid your sin debt in full, and that by faith you are accepting him as your personal Savior based on what Jesus did in dying a substitutionary sacrificial death for your sins, and that you're accepting Jesus as your personal Savior because he offered him, you're taking the gift. That's what it takes. You're being willing to receive what he's offered, the perfect, priceless, eternal gift of love. How could you ever turn that down? We hope you have a blessed Christmas and thank you for listening to Jesus, a gift from the Father. If you'd like to know more about Charles Stanley or In Touch Ministries, stop by intouch.org. This podcast is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia.